So yesterday, March 18th, 2024, Oprah aired a primetime special called Shame, Blame, and the Weight Loss uh, Revolution. And I have thoughts. <laughs> and I thought I would do this so we could maybe cover some of those thoughts, talk about some of the things she talked about. Um, I'm not here to speak on Oprah's character. <laughs> I know there's lots of opinions about her in all sorts of directions. I have to admit, I have a bit of a soft spot for her because I grew up, you know, in the Oprah era and she was on TV every afternoon at 4 p.m. So that had an effect. Um, but what I actually what I do think about this um, special is it really speaks to where we're at it really speaks to where we're at in this conversation around weight around fatness around obesity around health around pharmacological interventions um, and a lot is changing right now as far as public opinion of these things go um, some of the concepts that are now like, you know, dinner table conversations are things that obesity researchers and certain doctors, certain obesity doctors and people like me, weight educators um, and obesity educators have been talking for a while. So it's really interesting to watch this kind of move into the uh, public um, spectrum. So I have some thoughts about uh, how it all went down and how this kind of speaks to the conversation we're having uh, internationally uh, right now. Um, so let's go. So if you don't know me, I'm Deanna Bedoya. I'm a weight educator. I'm also a senior lecturer at Simon Fraser University here in uh, Burnaby, British Columbia, Canada. And uh, in addition to courses on nutrition and health promotion, uh, I also teach a senior level course on obesity weight management and some of these and if you want more actual information on some of the concepts that I'm going to cover or just on obesity in general um, I do have just like most of my lecture videos that I do for my class on YouTube so you can always check those out if you want some of like the research on uh, the causes of obesity the consequences of obesity and the management of obesity as well um, but one of the things I actually talk about and I focus about in my obesity class is around appetite. When I first started teaching the course, that was the thing that like really started standing out to me is that like, oh my gosh, <laughs> of course individuals, certain individuals develop obesity because their appetite signals are different. And this primetime special, this Oprah special really speaks to that concept because this special is coming out of the fact that these new weight loss medications are, you know, taking over the media, <laughs> taking over celebrities, taking over conversations, and people are losing a lot of weight on these medications. And why are they losing a lot of weight on these medications? These semaglutides in particular, and the terzepatide, I always say that one wrong, I think I said it right there. Um, why are people losing weight on these medications? Because they decrease the desire to eat. They change our appetite signals. The signals that make us want to eat are decreased. And some people have higher levels of those signals than others. And so what I'm hoping this conversation and things like this special start to open up is more of an appreciation of the fact that some people, it's harder for some people to maintain their weight than others. Why? Because they have higher appetite signals than other people. They have lower fullness signals than other people. And that is not something that's talked about because when we talk about weight, there's just so much shame and guilt that people have themselves or people force on other people with respect to people's weight because we think of it as just an issue of willpower and that if you were just strong enough and you just had more self-control more motivation then you would be able to control your weight better and this is the this is the messaging that I've had since I was a kid <laughs> and that has really messed with my mental health for a long time because my own struggles with my weight I was getting the signal like well just eat less you know just have more self-control but my body was screaming at me constantly to eat and you know finding kind of the balance between those things just never really happened it never really made sense it was hard to like rectify those two things because 
everyone's telling me just eat less, but my body's always telling me to just eat more. So there was so much shame and guilt that I experienced and that a lot of people with their weight have experienced over the years because it's always been framed as just a personal failing. And so watching this Oprah special, and of course an Oprah special has, you know, all these human interest stories, it, it brought up a lot of stuff for me. It brought up a lot of like those feelings I had as a kid or as an adult of like, all people projecting their beliefs around why I was the size I was and not just projecting their beliefs about it, but also like judgments, like it is a personal failing. You are wrong. You know, I heard someone say during the special that they also were judged on how good of a mother they were based on their weight. Oh, and some other quotes I, I wrote down from the special too that, um, kind of speaks to all the shame and guilt around weight is, you know, um, I felt like I was not being a good mother. I avoided going to the doctor because I had so much shame. Oprah saying I was ridiculed for 25 years around my weight. And if there's anything that I want to come out of this conversation is I'd love to see less shame and blame around weight because it is a complex biological and environmental and psychological outcome. The reason people weigh what they weigh isn't just because of a personal failing, it's because of a lot of things that are going on below the surface. And Oprah is such a good model for how hard it is to actually maintain your weight because Oprah has Oprah money. <laughs> she can literally afford all the things that most of us can't. She can afford a personal cook. She can afford the best nutritionist. She can afford the best personal trainers. She can afford everything, literally everything. And she, you know, doesn't maybe have the day-to-day -day worries that a lot of us have that, you know, stop us from maybe taking control of our health. And even her in her very privileged position, financially, she wasn't able to develop a healthy relationship with her weight until these drugs came around. And I'm not saying these drugs are for everyone, and this is not medical advice. This is please do not take any of this as medical advice, but it just goes to show that when there is now a drug available that helps to regulate appetite, we are finally seeing people who have struggled their entire life with their weight and have literally tried everything starting to see a difference in their weight. And again, there's side effects, not for everyone. You have to talk to your doctor if, if, these, <laughs> if these medications are right for you. I'm not here to promote them. I'm not on them myself. But it really just, this conversation and Oprah in particular really goes to show that no matter how much money you, you have, no matter how much you've tried to control your weight, it's freaking hard for some people compared to others. Um, I had this other quote that I watched this great documentary a, a few weeks ago called Your Fat Friend uh, about Aubrey Gordon, who's amazing, who runs the Maintenance Phase podcast. And I want to read this quote, which is, it is a real paradigm shift to look at someone my size or larger. And rather than thinking, boy, I wish that person would put in some effort, thinking that person may have put in a lot, a great deal of effort. And that might have been what got them here. So you might look at an individual in a larger body and think this person just didn't have willpower. They didn't try hard enough. They didn't try to diet. They didn't try to exercise. But most people in larger bodies have literally tried everything. But there is something going on below the surface that it's not just about appetite, but that's a big part of it. That's, I would argue, that's the driving force behind it right? There's something going on below the surface that is making it way difficult for some people versus others. And even someone like Oprah, who is, literally has the money to try everything and has tried everything and has the best experts at her dispose, disposal, it has still been so hard for her with her life, with during her life with respect to her weight. So what I'm hoping to come out of this conversation and maybe to come out of this special, I just think the special is just like a it's a stepping stone to greater conversations that are already happening, is that I'm hoping that we can finally get rid of, or at least challenge, what I call the willpower fallacy. 
the fallacy, the wrongness of believing that if people just had more willpower, they would be able to control their weight. And a really good example of this is my class. So my, my, my senior level class with people that are, you know, they're brilliant. <laughs> my students are brilliant. They're, they're in a hard program. They've made it to fourth year. They've done all the hard physiology classes. They are smart, driven, very self-motivated people. And every semester that I teach this class, my obesity class, I ask them, you know, what does your hunger feel like? What, is your, what does it feel like when you want to eat but you're not hungry? And the variety, the heterogeneity, the diversity of answers that I get from my students really shows how it's so easy for some people to eat less versus other people who really struggle. So someone who doesn't struggle with this high appetitive drive, when I've asked them, like, what does it feel like when you want to eat and you're not hungry? They I've said things like, I just eat when I want to eat, and when I don't want to eat, I don't eat. And it's so simple. And there's some people also on that end of the appetite spectrum, and I have a whole video on the appetite spectrum as well. There are some people on that end of the appetite spectrum where their appetite's very low that actually struggle to have any drive to eat. They never feel hungry, and they have to force themselves to eat. Why is that happening? Well, it's complex, <laughs> but mostly due to biology, mostly due to circulating factors in the body that for these people that don't have this appetite drive that are never sending them signals to eat in comparison to someone who when they speak of their like drive to eat, they're like, it's like a, it's like a monster. It's like, I can't stop it. It's like, I, tr I try so hard to resist it, but there's something inside of me that's like narrowed and focused on eating a particular thing. And it's like an itch I can't scratch. And that no matter what I do, I still feel like that drive to eat. That's the other side of the appetite spectrum. And there are a lot of people like that who food noise is a constant reality. And I am someone like that myself. I'm, you know, I, I preach, I teach on something called appetite mastery. I have a whole YouTube video series on this too. And because I practice that, my appetite levels are lower than they've ever been before. But that's taken a lot of work and a lot of research on my own part and a lot of trial and error on my own part to get to. Before I practiced Appetite Mastery, it was like I would just like ever, the voices in my head were just constantly eat, eat, eat. And Oprah has a great quote in the documentary that's like, it's not that you had the willpower, you just weren't thinking about food. You know, so I don't have any desire to gamble. I don't have any desire to do cocaine <laughs> or to do heroin or do some of these other really strongly addictive drugs. I have no desire to do those. So it takes, and I know food's not the same thing, but there's similar pathways that are recruited with drug dependency that are recruited, that are activated with people that have more of a lack of control when it comes to food. And so it's not the same thing, but it, if I were to look at someone with a drug dependency, I might say, well, just resist it. Just stop doing drugs. Well, that's easy for me to say because I never have a voice in my head that's telling me to do them all the time. So it's easy for me to resist. Just like it's easy for someone who's never had a voice in their head that's telling them to eat all the time to eat less. So personally, given how effective these drugs are at reducing our desire to eat, because they change some of the circulating factors that are higher or lower, it depends, right? Some of these circulating factors that make some people want to eat so much more than others. Because these drugs actually change those circulating factors that some people have versus other people, we are seeing that there's something going on biologically that's driving some people to eat more than others. And it's not just a lack of control, a lack of willpower. It's a complex biology that's pro-eating. And you could argue that there's like an evolutionary benefit to that. There's an evolutionary benefit to have the type of, let's say, genetic programming and circulating factors that make us want to eat a lot. Because during times of famine, we could fill up on a lot more food 
and we were better at, let's say, seeking out food so we could keep energy on our body so we could <laughs> ideally live to reproductive age so we could pass on our genes. So all that to say is that there's a complex biology at play that makes it so some people want to eat more than other people. It's not just a willpower thing. And I'm really hoping that this conversation around these drugs, these conversations of obesity, change kind of how we look at individuals who do struggle to eat less. Something else that came out of this uh, special uh, that's Another interesting conversation is the framing of obesity as a disease and a complex disease. And to be honest with you, that's how I frame my obesity class. We, in the first week, we talk about weight bias, we talk about complexity, systems thinking, and we talk about obesity as a disease because that's what the American Medical Association has been calling obesity since 2013. That's what the Canadian Medical Association has been calling obesity since 2015. And I'm cautious with this concept because I know not everyone agrees with it being classified as a disease. Now, what I don't want to see it classified as a personal failing. That let's let's take that out of the options of what we classify obesity or fatness or whatever you want to call it as. Let's let's get out the the judgments with respect to it. But there is this conversation in how conversation happening right now about whether obesity is a disease or not and people that are advocates for framing it as, it as a disease say well it's complex origins you know environment genetics biology psychology there's all these things going on that promote it it you know is a risk factor for other diseases but it itself has has can can affect your health uh, both in the way we move about this world but also in let's say the level of inflammation in our body so there's things about obesity that there's a there's a, a medical art there's an argument for framing it as a disease and part of the reason why these medical associations want it to be framed as a disease is because if it's framed as a disease then you have to if you're an insurance co company then you have to cover it if you cover diabetes medications and diabetes is a disease, well then why don't you cover obesity medications if obesity is a disease? So that's part of the conversation of, of framing it as a disease. Um, but I understand that there's some people that don't want that to happen. They, um, you know, I follow a lot of fat, act, fat activists that are like, don't, don't medicalize me, don't medicalize my body, don't medicalize my size. You know, just call me fat. You know, that's what Aubrey Gordon would say. Just say fat. You know, um, this is my body. I'm I, I'm okay with it. And, you know, I don't want to be your medical guinea pig, <laughs> so to speak. Or I don't want my identity to be framed by what my body looks like. Right? I don't want to be an obese person. I want to be myself who's in a larger body. So I don't know, I don't have actually a, an answer for how we should frame it. I frame it as a disease in my class because, well, I teach in a, bio, a, a department of biomedical physiology, so it makes sense to. Um, but I would say to this conversation that when you are, if you are a person in a larger body, you get to decide how you frame your body. Or if you ever even want to talk about your body, maybe you just don't even want to talk about your body. Maybe you're sick of talking about your body. And if you are working with people in larger bodies, if you're working, if you're like have friends um, that have obesity that are that are that are larger, you know, what do they do? They want to talk about their weight. Do you need to talk about their weight? You know, how would they prefer to talk about it or not talk about it? You know, so I think we have to be conscious of the fact that when we talk about diseases, we're also talking about humans. We're talking about humans that like. Are experiencing different relationships with their let's say disease or with their body in this case as well and there's advantages to framing obesity as a disease because then we can look for like pharmacological or or surgery or other interventions which can be very effective but I also understand the argument that like just like can we just not talk about me like a disease you know can we talk about me as a human and you know let me worry about things and not 
you know, have everyone always talking about my size. So this is another interesting conversation that's going on. I don't know if I've, I've done it enough justice, but these are things I, I think about a lot. And that's why I believe in the power of relationships, because if you have a relationship with someone, then you can, you know, navigate whether they want to or don't want to talk about their weight and how they want to or don't want to frame it. So that's another conversation that I think this this um, special, this Oprah special is helping to add to. Um, but I don't have a nice clean answer for what's the best way to frame obesity, although I, I, I will argue that I frame it as a disease. Another thing that for me came up during this special is that some of the language that was used and some of the personal interest stories that were covered too, they felt a lot like a lot of the old Oprah shows I watched about like the latest diet trends. They felt a lot like the like, oh, I went on this particular diet and I lost 40 pounds in this amount of time and look at me now and look how amazing I feel. And it just, again, it brought some shit up for me <laughs> to watch this because I'm like, oh, it's just like we're still just kind of saying, we're still having the same conversation that it's all about your weight. And I don't think it's all about our weight, but I know how appearance driven we are as a population. And I know that to sell products, you don't sell a product, you sell the transformation the product can give you. And so I know that that's been applied to diets in the past and weight loss interventions in the past. It's unsurprising that this like transformation with respect to just how you look is part of the way that these drugs are being sold. And it depends. Um, like Eli Lilly, I find it their obesity commercials. They're focused a little bit more on health, I think, <laughs> but it's all marketing <laughs> at the end of the day. You know, Weight Watchers is on this obesity pharmacology uh, road as well. And, you know, I think we're going to see a lot of commercialization of obesity medication and of obesity treatments too. And I'm just conscious of the harm some of these conversations around, you know, weight loss transformations have had on people in the past. And so, you know, I get companies are going to always look for, and people are always going to look for ways to like make money off of things. And I love money, nothing wrong with money, but um, it, it'll be interesting how much this whole area is commercialized over the next while. And we're just kind of in the beginning of this weight loss medication storm. There's a lot more of these anti-obesity drugs that all focused on appetite. Let's go back to that. There's a lot more of these in the pipeline too. So it'll be interesting how this conversation changes and how much it is uh, commercialized. And I'm worried about, I just know how much weight loss commercialization has had a negative effect on let's say eating disorders and let's say my own relate well I'll speak for myself on my own relationship with my body and my own relationship with food and myself and I'm just worried about how marketers are going to take this material and you know <laughs> like you know the there's a if you're watching this on YouTube there's a screenshot I took in, of a commercial that happened during the Oprah special from Gen Genesis Health Solutions weight loss program lose up to one pound of fat per day and there's like a before and after screenshot um, and it's just like it's the same freaking thing it's the same freaking thing that we've been seeing for decades about weight loss uh, transformations a pound a day it's like these promises that can drive hope so much for some people, but also feel, I don't know, they feel, I feel like still like we're forgetting about the person within all of this stuff and that a lot of this is just used for profit. You know, the food industry has been pumping <laughs> kinds of food in our into our systems that mess with our appetite for decades. They've been contributing to this problem all all the while for profit and profit has definitely driven definitely driven part of the obesity uh, epidemic and i'm just worried about how that's going to roll out and i don't know how it's going to roll out but i'm just aware of the fact that this is this whole area is going to be commercialized more and more and more and 
I wonder if that's going to cause more people to feel pressured into taking these medications, even if maybe they're not the right things for them, or to feel bad about themselves if they don't take the medications and they still struggle with their weight. So I don't know. We'll see. But that's something else that kind of came up for me while I was watching this um, Oprah special. So as you can tell, there's lots of conversations that are happening with respect to obesity, weight, weight management, obesity medications, diabetes medications. And I'm happy to see that they are happening. I think that if you are someone that has struggled with your weight, I'd say be very careful and gentle with yourself. Um, as you navigate media around weight and weight loss and these weight loss medications, uh, especially if you have a past with eating disorders like myself, I've struggled with binge eating disorder and bulimia myself, just be careful and be aware of what these things bring up for you. And I'm happy we're having these conversations, but um, you know, I, I think it's important to remember we're always talking about humans and we're talking about humans that sometimes have a lot of trauma around their weight. <laughs> or we're talking about humans that trauma has led to their current weight. And so there's a lot of shit packed in to our experience with our weight. And I just say, be careful as you navigate this conversation that's emerging. I'm happy we're having these conversations. I'm, happening, I'm happy we're challenging the, the willpower fallacy. I'm happy we're talking about appetite and obesity as, 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 as a complex you know, outcome of a complex set of factors, but uh, just always be careful with what these things bring up for you and, and how we're talking about these things too, because we're talking about humans at the end of the day. Okay. So um, after I watched the, the special, a few extra, extra, extra comments about the special, I felt like she rushed through it. It was very fast. You know, it was like human interest story, CEO of Weight Watchers, human interest story, people from, from the weight loss drugs companies, Nova Nordisk and Eli, Eli Lilly, uh, human interest story, um, chief medical officer, human interest, like it was like boom, 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 very fast. I felt like they went through the side effects a little bit quickly too. <laughs> I felt that it was weird. <laughs> how high up Oprah was standing when she was talking to people. I felt that was a bit weird. Um, but overall, I'm happy this this special happened because, I, like I said, I think it's part of a larger conversation. And Oprah has always, to me, been a reflection of where we are pop culturally, right? So she's always been a reflection of the culture. And she, this is a reflection and just how she's yo-yoed with different diets, et cetera, and different weight loss plans over the years, that's reflective of how things have been for so long. So I think her bringing this to the forefront, it's really reflective of these different conversations we're starting to have. And I'm happy we're having them. I just think we should proceed with caution. And I think that we should also be very careful and ideally stop all the shame and blame and guilt game. If you have never struggled with your weight, if you have never had food noise, if you've never had this voice in your head that's constantly telling you to eat, if you've never had the voice in your head that's literally eating and thinking about other foods, what you're gonna eat next while you're eating, if you've never had that, bless you, that's amazing. There's nothing wrong with that. But please understand that that a lot of people have that experience that I just talked about, including myself. And so if you've never experienced that, you just might not understand personally. You might not sympathize with people that struggle with their weight, that struggle with their eating. But can you find empathy for these individuals? And can you find empathy for individuals who have a very different experience than you? And instead of blaming and shaming and trying to figure out simple solutions to these things, you know, can we just try to get to know people as individuals and give them the choices and autonomy and freedom to make the choices that are best for them? Because this is about health, but it's also about quality of life as well. So can we stop the shaming? Yeah, and I pulled this comment from um, kind of the Facebook discussions uh, under Oprah's post about this special. And, you know, top comment there from Debbie Hooter is, let's stop the shaming and start the supporting. These drugs are life-changing for those of us who suffered all our lives. Right? Just like the woman on the show, I no longer think about my next meal. I no longer snack at night. I no longer overeat, etc. 
there are people that have always struggled with these things and these drugs for them are potentially life-changing. They are not for me, but that doesn't mean that I need to have an opinion about people that take them either, right? I'm in a privileged position that I have found other ways to manage my weight and I am in a privileged position that I have the time and the energy to do all the things that, <laughs> that are required to help manage my appetite. They're, they're complex, they take up a lot of time, and I have the mental space to do them. But for a lot of people, you know, they don't have the same privileges that I have. And, and I finally developed a, a healthy relationship with my body and my eating, but that's taken me seriously a lifetime. And I like teach on this stuff. You know, so I'm just saying that we can't judge other people's experiences by our own. And we have to realize that for some people, these medications are, like I said, life changing and finally give people their quality of life back. And can we just stop shaming others? And can we honestly just stop judging other people's experiences by our own experiences? Can we stop assuming that everyone experiences life the same as us? And that if they just behaved like us or did the things that we do, then they would have a particular outcome, right? That's not how things work. We're fundamentally different. That's one of the cool things about nature is how fundamentally different we are. So can we stop shaming and blaming and appreciate that people have very different experiences with respect to their appetite and their weight? Something else that's coming out of this conversation that I found in a comment under the, the Oprah post as well was, I feel like people with diabetes are being pitted against people with obesity, right? I feel like there's this like, shouldn't these drugs, right? So Colleen Waybright said, isn't it more important that diabetics get their medication to save their lives before weight loss? And this is an interesting comment because to me, how I interpret this is they're saying weight loss is more of just an aesthetic thing. But weight loss is actually one of the main things that lowers your risk for diabetes, type 2 diabetes. It's the main risk factor. Weight is the main risk factor for type 2 diabetes. And weight loss is one of the main things that reduces, that helps to manage diabetes, but also reduces your risk for diabetes. So I feel like there's still some blame and shame and there's still some like, well, obesity is a lifestyle choice. If you're still choosing to frame obesity as a lifestyle choice, then it makes sense that you would think, well, I have a disease, obesity is a lifestyle choice, I deserve the medications before those with obesity, um, which again, I think is an argument for framing obesity as a disease. I don't want people to be pitted against each other. Um, hopefully that'll stop a bit when there's enough of these drugs available to people. Right now there's a shortage, so when there's any kind of lack, people start fighting with each other and blaming each other and like I deserve it more than you and I'd love to not see that I'd love to see people be like well I have this this works for me and I have access to it I have this other thing this works for me and I have access to it if that kind of settles down then hopefully we can stop the infighting between um, people with diabetes and people with obesity and I still think some of that conversation is rooted in weight bias and is rooted in the belief that obesity is a lifestyle choice instead of obesity is the outcome of a complex biological psychological genetic and environmental so another conversation that this is all opening is around socioeconomic status and how you know these drugs that really do work for some people and that improve cardiovascular outcomes in some people, help to manage blood glucose in some people, you know, those people that maybe really need these medications, they either can't find them because they have less access to them for whatever reason, because maybe where they live or, or how famous they are, they are or aren't. <laughs> so there's that part, but there's also like a huge cost thing here. And something else that I'm kind of afraid of is that these drugs are going to promote further health disparities between individuals with money and individuals without money. And if these drugs continue to be about $900 a month, $1,000 a month, depends on the, on the medication and depends on where you are, but that's a friggin' ton of money. That is a ton of money. And yeah, maybe you'll save a bit of money on food and health related expenses, especially in the States, but you know, we're talking about a 
you know, if, if all people with money can now manage their health a bit better, whereas all people without money, now they don't have that same managing of health. It again divides up people with money and people without money with respect to health disparities, which is also already a big dividing line when it comes to health. People with money already have better health outcomes than people without money. And I'm worried that if these medications continue to be that expensive and access is restricted to certain socioeconomic um, classes, then you know we're again going to see more of these these health disparities that cause some people to not live as long as others or not to have healthy lives as others. And I don't love that stuff. You know, and then here I have a comment from someone that's like, problem It's problem is it's time for Medicare, which does not cover the cost of this medication, I'm assuming to cover it. Um, so my husband and I are delaying his full retirement with hopes that insurance company will soon get on board, understanding that paying for this med is less expensive than paying for all the maladies that result from obesity. So I think a conversation around access a conversation around what's covered, what's not. I was shocked. I just looked at my employee benefit plan at my university and anti-obesity medications are covered. They've been covered for a while. I was actually quite shocked about that, but that is not the norm. And I'm again in a privileged position to be able to work for this organization that provides that. So I'm worried about the health disparities. That's another part of this conversation. Another part of this conversation that came out from a comment on the, the Oprah post as well is that I don't want to see someone show up to a doctor's office. What I'm worried about is people showing up to a doctor's office for something else, not about their weight, right? They have some something going on with their reproductive system. They have something going on with their digestive system. They have some musculoskeletal, whatever. They show up to their doctor and a doctor sees a person in a larger body and immediately says, let's put you on medication, right? So this comment here from Susan Henderson Morgan is, these, these drugs are for people who overeat. Um, there's doctors that refuse to listen to their patients and push these drugs on them because they assume they overeat. And she speaks and she speaks about how she had something else going on and these were these drugs were pushed on her. So I think this speaks to a concept called the five A's, you know, which um, uh, it's talked about in obesity circles, which is if you're working with people to manage obesity, one of the first things you do is ask them if they want to actually talk about their weight or focus on their weight. And if they say no, then move on and do something else. But I don't want to see, and I see this happening, especially in the United States, is that these drugs are pushed on people. And I don't think that that's the way to go either. There's other ways to manage our weight and weight isn't the only thing that contributes to our health. There's many other things that contribute to our health. It's just one health indi indicator of many. So that's a conversation that I think should continue on as well. The other conversation that comes up from the use of this medication is that some people are embarrassed to use these medications because it's seen as cheating. <laughs> and this kind of goes back to something I said earlier, which is the fact that like the real cheat code, the real cheating, and it's not you're like consciously cheating, but the real cheat code is never having these drives to consume food in the first place or to have the kind of life that never leads to someone having to cope with whatever hell, <laughs> whatever crap is going on in their life. They don't need to cope with, let's say, food. The real cheat code is never having the drive to consume that so many of us have. So all these drugs are doing, they're not, to me, they're not cheating. They're like, they're giving you the thing you don't have that other people have, right? Other people have these signals that promote fullness that don't that don't make you want to eat so much, right? We don't have those. These drugs give us that. It's just it's just like it's different, but it's it's similar to the fact that like an individual with type 1 diabetes, they don't make insulin. It's not cheating to take insulin from an outside source because your body doesn't make it. And again, it's not the same thing, but for individuals with obesity, their body doesn't make the types of messengers in their body that help to reduce our desire to eat. So all we're doing is giving the, them the thing that they didn't have to begin with, which all these other people have. So to me, it's not cheating. But again, I think this cheating conversation really is just rooted in weight bias. It's like, it still stems back to the like, well, this is something that should be in your control. 
And if you're not able to control it on your own and you have to use medication, then you're cheating. So I don't agree with that. I don't believe that. Um, and I'd love to see, I think we have to talk about those things though, before we can start to hopefully eliminate them and process them. So all that to say, I did want to do this video, this conversation, just so we can, you know, talk about some of this Oprah special while it's fresh. Um, if you are someone that struggles with your weight, I, like I said earlier, just ask that you're gentle with yourself as these conversations continue to take place. They can be very uh, triggering for some of us, especially when, you know, we've heard so many times throughout history of there's this magic drug, there's this magic cure, there's this magic diet, there's this magic pill, whatever, that's going to help us finally feel in control of our weight. And I don't think it's as simple as that. I don't think these medications are for everyone, but they're definitely for some people. And there's no judgment in that. It's just kind of the way it is. It helps some people and some people don't have the kinds of side effects that other people have. But I think hopefully what this does is bring up this lot larger conversation about the fact that obesity is complex. The reason people are in larger bodies is not because they don't they lack willpower. <laughs> Be shocked at how much individuals in larger bodies have tried to overcome all the signals in their body that are constantly yelling at them to eat. You'd be shocked at how much willpower that has taken over time, right? It's easy for someone to have willpower when they don't have those messages. So hopefully this, I'd love to see this, this whole conversation lead to a little bit more compassion and understanding and appreciation of our fundamental differences as humans and that we stop just the blame and shame and the simple solutions. You just need to eat less. That's such bullshit solution and I'm really interesting ha, interested in where this will all go um, I thank Oprah for um, doing the special you know I know there's always like profit involved in this stuff and you know there's personal interest involved in that too I get that but um, she's just a reflection of what's going on culturally and we're, we're in the middle of a cultural shift I'm happy to see it but whenever we're in this shifting place, all these things can come up for people. And there's all these conversations happen. People have strong opinions that are often just rooted in their own experience only. So just be careful with yourself as you navigate through this. We'll see how things go. And if you want information about how obesity affects the body or how what things kind of lead to obesity, I have a just ton of YouTube videos on... Um, on the foundations of obesity, on weight bias, on obesity as a complex system, on all these different things, on obesity management. I'm going to be doing a, a video on the weight loss medication soon as well. If that's helpful for you and you like my style, feel free to, to contact um, to look at those. If you are someone that struggles with your appetite and you don't want to use weight loss medications, you might also want to check out my free YouTube series on appetite mastery uh, that speaks to that can help you figure out what are the things driving your own appetite. And um, I'll be running group programs on helping to manage our appetite without medications as well, or with medications, you know, as adjacent to that, because people on these medications still need to eat less for them to actually work. So if that's something that interests you, you can sign up for my newsletter. And you can also check out my uh, podcast, The New Weight Paradigm. Uh, season one of that gives a good overview on weight and you know my perspective on how we should frame weight and talk about it and how to individualize our approach to it as well. So if that's helpful for you, check that out and uh, I'll see you next time. Deanna Bedoya, see you later, bye.